Real Life Church. We are standing in front of the Pump House Regional Arts Center where Bluffs Community Church just had their launch service. Thank you for praying over them all week long. This has been an incredible week, an incredible day, uh, watching what God is doing in and through uh, our church and our church here now. And so thank you so much for that. I'm so excited to introduce to you today, Pastor Doug Graham. Pastor Doug uh, serves at North Central University as Vice President of Spiritual Life, which means he's the campus pastor for the students at North Central University. Pastor Doug also serves as the Assistant Superintendent for the Minnesota District of Assemblies of God Churches, which means he's one of my pastors. And one of the things I love about Pastor Doug is he has a passion for next generation Christian leaders to find their purpose, discover their empowerment, and to go and spread the gospel across the world. And I know Pastor Doug has an amazing word for you today as we lean in and talk once again about what does it mean to cut through all of the noise to hear from God. So will you welcome to, with me today Today, Pastor Doug Graham. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Good morning, Real Life Church. How are you this morning? I have so enjoyed already thus far worshiping with you and coming early, meeting with your team, and just very, very impressed with what God has been doing historically in this church and, and in this present moment and even in this present day. Very special day. For me, I mean, for me to have an opportunity to speak here at Real Life Church, uh, it's an honor. But uh, some of you may not realize that your vision, the vision that you've had as a congregation to go across lines from Viking territory to Packer territory and to plant a church in La Crosse, Wisconsin, uh, it's very, very special to me because I pastored in La Crosse, Wisconsin for 12 years. Uh, River of Life Church Assembly is uh, a, a church that's in that city of La Crosse on Alaska, and so for 12 years we raised our kids there, and now to hear that there is this brand new Bluffs Community Church being launched today, I'm very, very excited, and uh, you know, you sow seed into a community over the course of many years, over a decade, 12 years, and I have been praying since I heard that you were going to be planting a church in kind of my own uh, old backyard uh, praying for the church that I pastored, but also praying you need all kinds of churches to reach all kinds of different people. And uh, I am thrilled that Pastor Jake and his wife are, are launching past, with Pastor Esther as well. And I'm praying for their success. I've been praying that today, uh, even people that maybe I was trying to reach, we were trying to reach decades ago, perhaps are going to be reached through the ministry of this church in that, uh, ca that campus that is, is real life and Bluffs community. So I commend you, and I love Pastor Jim and Beth. They're just fabulous people, love their leadership. And I also want to say, uh, before I get going, I was very impressed with uh, how this church responded to, in response to the passing of one of our students, and who was in your ministry here, Micah Pennington, and uh, your response in love and support to the family, and you were a church home for Micah, and you're a church home for many North Central students. I'm looking across, and I'm seeing some of you here this morning, and I'm just so grateful that we have this strong partnership at our school with this church. Um, and so, so grateful to be able to be here this morning. Pastor Jim has told me that this month you've been talking on the subject of hearing God's voice, how to, how to hear the, the whisper of God's voice and how to lean into God speaking to you. And I want to bring a message to you that I that isn't specifically along the lines of that series, but as you've been kind of, you've been learning about how to hear the voice of God, and, it, and a lot of it being a prayer emphasis, which is excellent, I want to bring the, the companion to what is so necessary in hearing God's voice. It's the combination of our ability to pray and, and to connect with God in prayer, but it's also the ability to open God's Word and to hear Him speak to us from His Word. And so I want to give you three different concepts as it relates to, to God's Word. Before I get into that, just a little bit more about myself. I have been serving these last five and a half years. I'm in my sixth year at North Central University as the Vice President for Spiritual Life. I graduated from North Central University way back in time, 1986, and then spent about 30, 35 years in pastoral ministry as a youth pastor, as an associate pastor, pastoring a couple of different churches, La Crosse, one of them, and then pastoring in Bismarck, North Dakota. And then having the opportunity to come back to my alma mater and become the campus pastor f with a, a thousand or so students in ministering into their lives so that from North Central they go all the way around the world, whether it be 
in pastoral leadership, children's ministry, or missions, or education, or journalism, or sports management, or entrepreneurship, launching those students around the world to, as our, what our president says, uh, Scott Hagan now says, is, is a beautiful metaphor, an image that around the world our students water the earth with God's good work and his kingdom work. And so thank you for being a church, highly supportive of North Central University down through the years. I want to say thank you for, for being supportive and also being a great church for our students to be a home away from home church. You know, I, I, I just, on a side, just want to encourage you, whenever you have the opportunity, and I, and I know that through the year, uh, students will be checking out churches, and they'll be looking for a home church, and you might see a, a, a larger number of church, uh, students looking for a home church in September, October, when a lot of them as freshmen come to North Central for the very first time, and I want to say thank you for being a warm congregation, because uh, I know what it's like to have been a college student, a freshman my freshman year and looking for a church that was just like my home church. And I never found a church that was just like my home church. And I was able, though, to find a church that was warm and friendly, that helped me to understand that, that, that uh, I have within me the ability to have more than just one favorite church, favorite home church. And so I want to just say thank you. If you ever see a college-age student, and they might not be a North Central student, they might be a University of Northwestern student or a Bethel student, if you see a college-age student here kind of by themselves or in a group of two or three, reach out to them and love them because uh, they're looking to find something that will minister into their lives. And if you're friendly and you give them a warm handshake and make them feel welcome, they will probably find this to be their home away from home church. And there's nothing more valuable to a student in their college years who wants to love Jesus through their educational journey to have a church that really they can call home while they are a long way from home. So this morning, um, I want to bring your attention to the importance of God's Word. And the message is simply entitled, Certainty. No matter what happens, we always have to remember that God has a plan, and that plan is in His Word. And, and as you've been kind of coached and been taught, and, and, and Pastor Jim speaking on the subject of prayer, it's all set for you to take the, the next step and, and investigate and to be awakened to how God through prayer wants to take you to His Word and remind you of the plan that He has for you. Uh, about uh, 11 years ago, almost to the day, the date was January 15th, 2009, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 took off from LaGuardia Airport at 326 in the afternoon. Less than one minute into the flight, Chief Pilot Chelsea Sullenberger reported a double bird strike that caused engine failure in both of the jet air engines, and it required a very, very quick turnaround to LaGuardia Airport. Sullenberger, however, was told that though to divert to LaGuardia, he needed to go to an airport that was a little bit closer, and he was to divert to a nearby airport in Teterboro, New Jersey. Sullenberger calculated, though, that the jet wasn't going to even be able to make it to Teterboro, and so he prepared for an emergency landing on the Hudson River. The plane splashed into the waters just off of 48th Street in Midtown Manhattan, one of the busiest and most clearly watches of, uh, stretches of river along the bank there. And after staying afloat for several minutes, all 155 passengers were transported safely to the land through various watercraft and Coast Guard boats. It's a fascinating, fascinating story, and I'm sure that perhaps you maybe watched the movie starring Tom Hanks that was entitled Sully. And that was a very fascinating movie because the movie gave us the backstory about what took place prior to and how the incident took place and safely landing. And then it took us into the investigation that was very, very interesting because Sullenberger was not out of the water after he had successfully landed that plane on the Hudson River. That in fact, he had to face investigators as to was that the right decision in putting 155 souls at risk landing in the Hudson River? Did he really have to land the plane in the Hudson. The fact of the matter is that his quick response was, in fact, very heroic, and his aviation skills and expertise definitely saved the lives of all of those who were on board. And the question that 
everyone was asking is, what was the key to all 155 people surviving that near catastrophic event? What was the key to their survival? I mean, think of it if you were a passenger and you're on the plane and one minute into the flight, there's that sudden awareness that something has gone drastically wrong and you look outside your window and there's an engine on fire. And you look out the other way, and there's another engine on fire. This is what we call the the, the, the human experience of uncertainty. The human experience of uncertainty is universal, and and it thrusts itself upon our lives at the most unexpected times. That something happens, and we're not accustomed to it, and we're not prepared for it, and we ask ourselves, what is going to happen? How are we going to make it? Right away, the answer to the question, what was the key, everybody points to the captain, Captain Chelsea Sullenberger. And no doubt, this was a very, very skilled pilot. And it points, though, to another key reason why all of those people on board made it successfully to their families. It wasn't just that there was a pilot, but there was a plan. There was a plan. See, if you're a pilot, it's all about understanding the plans. You've got in-flight plans, you've got takeoff plans, and, and of course you have all these emergency plans that you've been trained to. And in this situation, the pilot performed heroically because he was trained to a plan. A lot of people were calling Captain Sullenberger a hero because of what he did. And he said in interviews following this historic, heroic event. He said, I'm no hero. I only did what every pilot would have done. I simply did what I was trained to do. I simply followed the plan. My question to you this morning is, are you following the plan? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to train you to the plan? Are you daily giving attention to the plan? Every pilot, regardless of how many times he or she has flown the airplane, they go through the checklist again. They go through the checklist again. Even though they have the checklist memorized in their mind, they go through it again and again and again and again and again. And it's not unlike the everyday again of opening ourselves up to God's Word, developing that ability to hear God when we pray on a daily basis, the ability, the discipline to open the Bible day after day in our devotional times, to come to church Sunday after Sunday, to, to on Wednesday nights at this church. You got a couple of great, you got a couple of great Bible studies happening on Wednesday night for men and women. I mean, are we working with the Holy Spirit so that when that time of uncertainty hits us, we know where to go, we know what to do because we've been trained to the plan. Now, the Bible doesn't necessarily speak to every specific detail detail human in, uh, encounter that you might have, but God's Word speaks in principle and in truth to every circumstance and every situation that you might have. God's Word is that twin voice into our lives, one of them being the whisper of God's Spirit when we're praying, but it's also the, the whisper and even the loud beckoning of God's voice as we read His Word. We live in tremendous times of uncertainty in this world. We have a lot of economic uncertainties. We have a lot of cultural uncertainties. We have a lot of political uncertainties. But the deepest level of uncertainty is not economic, and the deepest level of uncertainty in our world is not political, and the deepest level of uncertainty in our world is not morality or immorality. The deepest level of uncertainty in our world is when we all of a sudden are wondering, where is God's voice? Where is His voice? Which brings me to the point of the message. When life surrounds you with uncertainty, the best response is to invest yourself in what is most certain in life. And that which is most certain in life is not found in the White House, but is found in God's house. It's found in God's Word that which never, ever changes. So this morning, I want to challenge you and encourage you and point you to run to God's Word, to trust God's Word, and to put every ounce of confidence that in the uncertainties of whatever you're dealing with, that God's Word 
is where you run to for three reasons. Number one, we run to God's Word because the Bible gives us answers that no other document, that no other source can give to us. That the Bible is alive and active and it, it's able to pierce our hearts and it's able to speak in such delicate and detailed ways that it separates, it separates joint, uh, uh, bone from, from, from muscle. It has that ability to kind of pierce into the very intricacies of our lives. And so God's Word gives us answers that we'll find no other, uh, no other place else. Gilbert Keith Chesterton, maybe you don't know them by that name, but perhaps you know him by the name G.K. Chesterton. He was a British journalist who lived in a, a previous era of time, and he was known for his insightfulness. He was a literary genius. You'll find on the internet lots of quotes of G.K. Chesterton. And uh, he was a larger-than-life individual. He was, he was loud. He was, he was a large man. And and he had, a, he had a quick wit about him that, that if he wanted to, he could say something or write something that would just cut to the bone, and you either loved him or you hated him. And um, he was asked on one occasion by a British journalist who knew that he was of a Christian uh, faith follower, asked him the question, Chesterton, if you were on a deserted island and you could only have one book, what book would you want to have? And um, I bet you would want to have the Bible, right? And Chesterton said, actually, no, I wouldn't want the Bible. And it really kind of confused the journalist because he knows that this is a religious man. Well, maybe it's not the Bible. Maybe it's, uh, he probably has the Bible, you know, a lot of it memorized. So I bet it would be, you're a good British citizen. I bet it would be the works of Shakespeare. And Chesterton said, no, I, I wouldn't want to have. If I only had one book on a desert eye, I wouldn't want Shakespeare's works. Well, then what book would you want to have on a deserted island if you could only have one book? And Chesterton said, uh, well, if I was on a deserted island in the South Pacific and I only could have one book, I would have the book that is entitled, A Manual for Building a Ship. <laughs> I would want to have something that gives me an answer to the situation that I'm in. And I don't think... The Bible will teach me how to build a ship. Well, maybe if I read about Noah, maybe I'd learn a little bit. But. You know, a lot of people have very little interest in the Bible because to them, it doesn't teach them the how-tos of the mess that they're in. They're in a mess in their marriage, and I've read the Bible, and I don't find one, two, three on how to fix my marriage, or I'm in a financial mess, and I never read much, you know, what I know of the Bible, it doesn't really teach me how to get out of my mess. And so this is why at Barnes and & Noble and, and, and Amazon Prime and wherever you get your books, the most popular books still to this day are self-help books, the books that give us the one, two, three on how to get out of whatever mess or entanglement that we are in. And so a lot of people, when they're encouraged to read the Bible, they'll say, I have no interest in the Bible. I'm not going to read the Bible because it's, a, it's, philo it's philosophical and it's theological. And it's, yeah, that's good stuff. But I'm in a pinch in life and I'm not going to spend time reading something that's not going to give me the one, two, three on how to get out of my life circumstance. And this is why a lot of people have never read the Bible. This is why a lot of Christians have not really gotten addicted or have become infatuated with God through His Word because they've tried to read the Bible and they have read the Bible over a course of a number of days, but it hasn't stuck inside of them because they bring a, 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 an expectation into their Bible reading as I expect God to give me a specific answer every day that I read the Word. Let me explain to you how God's Word works. God's Word works at a deeper level than just the one, two, three of how you get out of situations. Let me tell you that God's Word speaks to how we avoid getting into those messes in the first place. But, Pastor Doug, I'm in a mess, and so I, how do I get through the issues of this ship that I need to build. Well, I'm here to tell you that God has ways of guiding and directing you, even in the practical matters of life that you find yourself drawn into. The Bible is the ultimate how to build a life manual. 
It has the ability to point the way when you have made a wrong turn. It has the way of communicating how to get out of a ditch, even financially, if you have found yourself in a financial ditch. If you've found yourself at odds with your children or you found yourself at odds with your, with your boss or the people that work for you, there's all kinds of ways in which the Holy Spirit, with a trained ear in prayer and a discipline in reading God's Word, God has a way over time to bring to you answers that you are so desperately searching for. Psalm 119, 105 says, The Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my to my path. I love that metaphor that God's word is like a lamp. I've got one of these. How many of you got one of these? Show it to me. How many of you got one of these? And, and I see some of you are, yeah, of course, you're taking notes. You're not, you're not doing your grocery list. You're, uh, but you're, okay, you got one of these. You want to know the thing that I use the most with my iPhone? It's exactly right. It's this right here. This, this flashlight has saved me on so many occasions when I've needed just a little bit more light to see that screw that I've got to screw in or I've got to pick up that, that pill or that vitamin that I've dropped on the floor. This light, this flashlight, it's, it's just ingenious. God's Word is a lamp unto our feet, a light to our pathway. But you notice that this is not a floodlight. So I can't go out spotting deer with this thing. And, and that's the nature of God's Word. He doesn't guide us with answers that give us answers for next week or next year necessarily, but He gives us enough light to give us answers for the next step. Because if we have too many answers for the future, then we're not going to be living by faith. And so God gives us just enough faith to take the next step. So if you are in a bind or you're in a situation where you need God's Word to give you an answer today, He's going to give you an answer for today. And as you take that obedient step today, He's going to give you another pointer tomorrow and another the next day. And before long, you'll look back over the course of a few days, a few weeks, a few months, He really did take you out of your wilderness and through His Word, He guided you. So we run to the Bible. We're trained to the plan that is in the Bible. We prepare ourselves in life through the plan that God's Word gives to us because the Bible gives us answers that no other document, no other source can give us. Number two, we run to the Bible because the Bible creates alignment. It creates this beautiful sense of alignment. Look at this verse in Psalm 61, first two verses. The psalmist writes, Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. As my heart grows faint, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Whenever you see the phrase from the ends of the earth in the Scripture, it's trying to communicate a vast distance from the ends of the earth. That's not just like from across the street. When the writer, when the Scripture says, from the ends of the earth, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so the psalmist is saying, from the ends of the earth, in a sense, he's communicating, God, I feel so far from you. You feel so far from me. I feel like between you and me, I'm at the ends of the earth. And he further describes his, his dilemma by saying that, that I, my heart is growing faint. I'm losing strength. I'm losing hope. And in this situation, we might say that the psalmist has lost his alignment. Alignment in a car vehicle is defined by all four wheels pointed in the same direction, and all four wheels are on the pavement, and they're rotating in the same ratio. They're working together. And when you have a tire that's that's not in alignment, you have what's called a pull. You're driving and it's pulling one way or the other and that indicates that your wheels are not in alignment and that creates problems. It creates more wear and tear on your tires and it creates uh, uh, poor gas mileage and so you want to make sure for efficiency and for direction that everything is pointed in the right direction. What does uncertainty do? It pulls us. It distracts us. We lose a little bit of our faith. We lose a little bit of our hope. You can tell when someone's out of alignment, when something uncertain happens to them, and you can see it because they, they, they freak out. They, like, what's going to happen? Or how are we going to make it? But people who are in proper alignment through God's Word, 
They'll have something uncertain happen to them, but you'll hear them say, but I know God's with us. I know that Jesus is with us. Some people who are in great alignment and something unsettling happens, they say this. They say, God, I can't wait to see how you're going to help us through this problem. But uncertainty has a way of causing us to lose direction. Admiral Richard Byrd wrote a book in 1938, and the book was entitled Alone. Alone. It's his story of his solitary adventure near the South Pole where he spent four and a half agonizingly lonely months all by himself. No one was more alone than this man as he weathered the 50 to 60 below temperatures in a small hut all by himself. One day, after he had been cooped up in his hut for days, thinking that he was just going to go stir crazy, he decided that he had to get outside and get some fresh air. He bundled up against the cold, dressing as warmly as possible. He opened the door, and he stepped outside. And it wasn't just the frigid temperatures that hit him, but there was a fierce wind. And not only a fierce wind, but he noticed that the snow was falling like blankets, heavy snow falling. And so he carefully walked about 10 paces, and he turned around to make sure he could still see the hut. Walked another 10 paces, and the hut is now getting a little bit more dim. And he walks a little bit further, and he thinks to himself, hmm, this is a lovely walk I'm going out on. Wouldn't it be sad if I got lost? And so he turned around. Where's the hut? And it just, he got totally disoriented because it was a total whiteout of the wind and the snow. And you know, it's very interesting. A, you can tell a person's character when they get panicked. Or you can tell the resiliency, or you can tell what the foundation of a person's life is when something uncertain hits them and they go into panic mode, or do they go into, no, I'm going to take a deep breath, and I'm not going to panic because panic is my worst enemy. So he thought to himself, how do I find my way back? when I don't know what is north and what is south and what is east and what is west, because if I go one direction, I might be walking further from the hut. And so this is what he did. He didn't know if the hut was over there or over there or over there. He just was totally discombobulated. So he, he took the heel of his boot and he broke up a bunch of ice and he, and he made a little tower about three feet tall to build a reference point. And he built it up, and then he took his flashlight, and he carved a, an arrow. And he, he looked at his point of reference, and he followed the arrow as straight as he could go. And he walked about 10 paces. He turned around, and, and he could still see his tower. But if he went further than that, he might not. So, so he, okay, he's got the point of reference, and now he looks. Can I see my hut? Can I see my hut? Can't see my hut. So I'm going to go back to my tower. And he goes back to his tower. And he makes a little, he angles it a little bit to the right. And he makes another arrow. And he walks 10 paces, again, to a point where if he goes any further, he might lose his reference point. Okay, and then he looks. And now he's able to look a little bit further over here. No hut, no hut. And he, so he walks back. And he does this over and over and over again. Almost, he almost feels like he's made a complete circle. And with the radius of about 10 paces, he still can't find his hut. So he goes back to his very first arrow that he points. And he, he goes his paces. And if he goes any further, he might lose it. So he builds another point of anchor, another little tower. And he goes another 10 paces and extends his ability. And you know what? without losing his mind, without getting panicky, just doing that rhythm over and over again, eventually he could see the outline of his hut and he made his way back safely. What's the point? The point is that we have to have a reference point that never changes. And of course, it's God's Word. But the key is that he couldn't ever get out of the line of sight of that point of reference. See, that point of reference doesn't mean anything if you get beyond it and you can't see it. A point of reference 
is great as long as you're always keeping your eye on the point of reference, that wherever you're going, you're keeping your eye on that point, you're good. But even if you take your eye off it for a second, take one more step, where is it? That's where we can get into trouble. Now, how does that apply to us when we talk about the alignment of God's Word in our life? God's Word has a way of aligning us, not just directionally in the circumstances of life, but it has the greater ability of aligning our heart, our attitude, our perspective, our, the way in which we think about life. And let me tell you, the world is not getting more Christian, that the world in which we are living is becoming more and more like Isaiah said when he prophesied. Some of you are saying black is white and white is black and some of you are saying bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. What we're seeing in our world today is there's, a, there's just a, a complete upside down version of what we know to be the way, the truth, and the life. And we have to keep our wheels properly aligned in God's Word. And how do we do that? We keep chasing God's Word. We don't live our life beyond the stretches of God's Word. Now, does that mean you've got to be reading your Bible every day legalistically? No, and that's not the point. The point is that you are frequently, so frequently in God's Word as a church member, uh, as, a, as a father, as a mother, as a teenager. You're learning to discipline yourself to be in God's Word so that in, essentially you're always keeping your eye on God's Word as the world is distracting you to see all kinds of things that are not right. That when you see the attitudes and the philosophies of our world today, and you see the images of our world today, immediately you know that's not God. Immediately, that's not God. Immediately, that's not God. And if we don't continue to keep our focus and keep a line of sight in God's Word, sometimes our attitude can change and we can start to bend and we can start to become uh, flexible such that we begin adopting the ways of our world and before you know it our eye is off the tower so we need to hear god's voice and to hear god's voice we need to run to the word it gives us answers it gives us alignment and then finally the bible is an anchor for us the bible is an anchor the bible is an anchor we have to have foundation in our lives that is unshakable. We have to have that reference point that never changes, but we have to also have that anchor that is anchoring us against the winds and the waves of our world. Michael Plant was a young man who had a dream, and his dream was to sail around the world solo, all by himself. He was raised on the water. He was a skilled uh, tactician, sailor, and he was very, very skilled. He'd been raised on it. And, and this dream to, to sail around the world all by himself, his friends were not, never alarmed by that. His family was never alarmed by that because he was so skilled. He had a sailboat called the Coyote, and he equipped the Coyote with all of the necessary technology so that he could be in instant contact with, uh, with anybody who would, that he could get in contact with if he got into trouble. And so the day that he sailed off into the sunset, there was no worry about his safety or any doubt that he wouldn't accomplish his goal. A few days into his adventure, his family lost contact with him. No communication from Michael. And they thought, that's not a big deal. He's probably in a storm. He's busy, you know. But day one moved into day two, day three, day four. And about day six, the family said, this is not right. He wouldn't go six days with reaching out to us. And so an official search, Coast Guard search, was launched. And Michael Plant was never found. He was never found. His, his sailboat was found. The coyote was found upside down. Now, those of you that understand sailing, that's not usual. That sailboats are never meant to be upside down. Okay? Sailboats are driven by, by the winds. And the stronger the wind, the better. So how do they keep from tipping over? Well, they have this keel underneath the hull, this long extended weight that even if it flips upside down, it'll right itself. Sailboats are meant to be pushed around. And they found that when the when they found the coyote, the 
the keel had broken off from the underneath the sailboat. And any significant wind would have would have would have flipped that boat upside down and would have done it in a flash. So what probably happened is that he hit a wave and it flipped him upside down and he didn't know that the keel wasn't there anymore and it probably was so quick he didn't have time to hit the SOS button. He didn't have time to pull the ripcord of the inflatable life raft. It just happened, boom, and he was gone. Here's the principle. The principle of of a life well lived, hearing God's voice, being directed by God's word through the, the, the seas and the winds of a world that in many, many ways is is chaotic is that you have to have more weight beneath the surface than what's above the surface we are drawn as human beings to the things that are above the surface the money the houses the activities the vacations many of which are not wrong but without the weight beneath the surface that foundation We fall in love with the things that are at the surface. And when we lose our money and we lose our health and a family member dies or things go sideways and we can't take the, whatever, we tend to sometimes flip upside down. You can can make it through any storm. You can make it through any heartache. You can make it through any tragedy. We've seen the testimonies of so many people who have gone through horrific experiences because they had a, Foundation. They had weight beneath the waterline. And we add weight to the waterline by praying and hearing God's voice and being in the Word day after day, anchoring our soul to the eternal things that God has established so that when the temporary things in life hit us and go wrong, we say to ourselves, God, this stinks, but I know that you've got a plan and you're working something out. And He's able to write us regardless of what has flipped us. I'd like you to bow your heads and close your eyes. So I'd like to just say a brief prayer before I turn it back to Pastor Taylor. Lord, I I ask you to minister to these great people here at Real Life Church. And I don't know. There might be someone who's visiting for the first time, someone who's been recently coming. And it might be just a whole bunch of people that this is their home and they're here week after week. But all of us are susceptible to the uncertainties of life. And some of us might feel a little bit of a, of a, of a pinch, even in our spirit, because maybe lately we've not been as persistent in the Word. And this is not meant to give us guilt at all, but it is to provide another encouraging reminder of how beneficial God's word is to us. It is our life saver. It's our life preserver. It is that which keeps us close to answers, properly aligned, and it gives us that great anchor that never shifts regardless of life circumstance. So minister to people this morning who maybe are going through some difficulties. And Lord, may you love them closer to yourself through your word knowing that, God, you're in control. Heaven and earth is going to pass away, but your word will always, always remain. Let it remain solid inside of our hearts and our lives. I pray that through this church, Lord, you would reach this community, reach this part of the metro. Lord, thank you for the missionaries this congregation supports that go around the world. And of course, thank you for the brand new work in La Crosse that has the DNA of Real Life Church. Thank you, Lord. 